in with compost tea, you really do want to make sure that it stays aerobic, because if it goes anaerobic, you can essentially poison your plants, um, because what then you will no longer have all the organisms that you need. Um, when it goes anaerobic, uh, all the fungi will start to be consumed by the anaerobic bacteria. Um, all the protozoa that are beneficial will go dormant and disappear. Um, the nematodes will disappear as well, and then you'll be left with virtually just an anaerobic bacterial tea, uh, which can cause lots of diseases and illnesses and all that kind of stuff. Um, so keeping it aerobic is essential, and you want it to be actively aerated as well. Um, a lot of the time, people don't really understand that with compost tea, uh, there's an act, you need to have a high-quality compost that has the microorganisms in it, because you could just have um, some random like sheep manure kind of compost that was done on a really large scale, but you don't know that note that there isn't any E. coli in there, um, that kind of thing. And the human pathogens will be present in that kind of uh, material. So you need to make sure that you have documentation and everything that the compost that you're using actually has the aerobic and beneficial organisms in it when you go to brew your tea. Um, as well, the time for tea, uh, it can, it depends on the season and the climate that you're in, how long you want to brew tea for. Um, if it's the summer and it's warm outside, you can get away with brewing in 18 hours. But as it gets colder and everything, you need to brew for a little bit longer. Um, you can brew upwards of about 48 hours uh, when it's cold. As well, depending on the season, you want to make sure that the temperature of the tea is at the same temperature as the plants that you're going to apply it for. Um, if you're brewing inside in the winter time and it's about 70 degrees inside and so every temperature will have different organisms in it um so and then you go and apply that out into a cold field all those organisms are just going to die and they're going to go dormant and they're not going to work for you essentially um so compost tea is really great um for replacing the organisms in the soil as well as allowing them to create a barrier on the leaf surface of plants as a foliar application. Um, and essentially, when you use compost tea as a foliar application, you need to make sure that there's a fungal component in it, because you will not be able to suppress any sort of disease like a blight or a flavor, any kind of thing like that, um, without having at least 5% of that tea having fungi in it. Um, and you can make sure to have that by having a really high fungal uh, compost to start with um, and what you can do to establish that fungal component in your compost uh, is feed the compost before you brew so about uh, two weeks before you start to brew you can start to feed your compost with um, hydrolysates like I said before humic acids you want to make sure to stay away from conventional humic acid because it's essentially leonardonite which isn't actually humic acid um, it's just been placed into that title. It's just been given that title for whatever silly reason. Um, but humic acid you also have to use. You have to take into consideration what kind of water you're using. Um, a lot of the water in America especially has either chlorine or chloramine in it, which will kill your, that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to kill all the things in the water. Um, so you need to make sure that you can complex it out, especially chloramine. And you can do that with humic acid. So if you have a really good compost, you can extract humic acid from the compost and add just a smidgen into your water um, just to complex that out because humic acid is so complex. Um, it will bind essentially to toxins in the soil, um, which is a part of restoring soil as well. Um, uh, with chlorine, you can um, off-gas it through a bubbling process. And you want to do that for... I guess you want to, it depends on how much water you have um, that you're trying to off gas it. Um, but you can also taste the water and see what's in it um, and see if like you can still taste the chlorine, all that kind of stuff. Um, a little bit of chlorine is okay. A little bit of chloramine is okay. But um, you just need to make sure you can complex that out so you can give the life back to the organisms that you're trying to cultivate. Um, so, so yeah. Um, Trying to think about anything else. You can also use compost tea as a soil drench. Um, but like I said before, the only issue with that is that you will only see benefits for about 45 months. 
because the food resources for the organisms will run out. And the organisms are essentially what are cycling the nutrients at, in the root zone. Um, because the root will essentially tell the organisms what it needs, they'll make an association. Um, and so the roots will exude and exudate, and that will uh, link in essentially to the bacteria, which will then bring it what it needs. And in exchange, the plant will give it back food. Um, same thing with mycorrhizae, fungi, and everything like that. But um, the plant available nutrients, all that stuff happens when bacteria is consumed and when fungi is consumed by protozoa um, and nematodes and other organisms that are in the soil. And so essentially, uh, one of my mentors calls it the poop loop. So it's the poop loop that really brings that um, nutrient cycling into the soil for the plants. Um, and when you can actually get the nutrient cycling up uh, to a high enough level, you can see things like 150% increase in yield, um, much higher nutrient dense foods that are so much healthier for you. Um, as well, replacing those organisms in uh, the soil through compost tea, you will be able to start to rehabilitate the soil and you'll start to create more soil structure and you will begin to further the soil successional stage um, so that the soil successional stage can match that of the plant um, so that it's optimized for the plant and its growth. Um, so, but when you use tea as a foliar spray, you need to make sure that there's enough uh, organisms in it so you're not you don't dilute it out too much, but water, you don't really dilute a tea. When you try to use tea as a foliar spray, you can add water to it, but the water is really just a carrier for the organisms. But also you need to make sure that when you try to, so you try to spray the tea, it mean that how you spray the tea doesn't destroy the organisms as well, um, which is all why I use a microscope for all this stuff, so I can identify and see what's actually happening in the tea. But, um, and that way you can make sure you've, you had a brew, you brewed enough so that you can select for the organisms that you want. Um, so, so yeah, uh, do you guys have any questions or anything? Yes, we yeah. have questions. Yes, we have questions. Okay. Shit, we got, okay. Okay, hey. <laughs> Can you can you put on can you put on headphones? Okay. Uh, can you hear us? His microphone's in front of the speaker. Um, hello. Okay. One question is: There's a. Well, I found an amazing mechanism. You mentioned how the exudates work. Tell us how the exudates on leaf surfaces work. To, uh, when the compost tea works to prevent things such as aphids? Okay, um, essentially how compost tea works, when you replace the organisms on the leaf surface, you're essentially uh, filling up all of these infection sites. Um, most of the time, leaves out there, uh, acid rain, pollution, high wind, will remove the organisms that are on the leaf surfaces. So using a foliar spray, you replace those. Um, and in doing so, uh, the leaf surface will exude exudates. It's essentially, I've been thinking more and more about it as kind of like press, like respiration. It just kind of exudes it. Uh, and when it exudes it, it uh, feeds microorganisms. And if you decide that you want your plant to survive, you're going to put beneficial organisms back out there. Um, so when you can completely cover the leaf surface with beneficial organisms, they will create a symbiotic relationship and they will uh, do a foliar feeding back and forth um, through the organisms and the leaf. Um, and when you can do that, uh, it basically covers up anything that would attract insects or any other kind of disease um, because the microorganisms will outcompete any other kind of uh, non beneficial organism, uh, like an omice seed, which is basically a mold, a water mold, that kind of thing. Um, but with insects, uh, also, what will happen is that when you replace it, it won't taste good anymore to the insect, um, so they won't be attracted to it as much. Granted, there will still be some around, but if you can get the soil up to snuff, uh, you, your yield will just completely outcompete any kind of damage from an insect anyway. Um, but another uh, thing with the foliar spray is if you were to look 
and a, um, a really healthy corn plant under an electron microscope, you would not be able to see the leaf surface itself because it would be so covered with microorganisms. And all of that, it basically creates a castle wall around the leaf and protects it from any kind of disease. Um, and it basically uh, detracts insects uh, from wanting to feed on it. Um, so because I've thought about uh, it in the sense that essentially when you have an insect problem, there's something wrong with the soil because uh, the soil, nature is incredibly intelligent and it's trying to create a soil environment that is specific to the plant that's trying to grow. Um, so for me, it's when you have insects um, and aphids and that kind of a thing, it will essentially, uh, the aphids to me are trying to bring the organic matter back down and into the soil to bring the fungal component back up so that the soil successional stage is appropriate for the plant. So, um, so yeah. So on leaf surfaces, uh, you essentially fill in all of those plausible infection sites um, with beneficial organisms. But you have to replace them. You have to continue to put them out there. Um, and so you have a soil food web that is so... Okay. Um, so does that answer your question? Uh, let me... Let me uh... Let me just ask another part of it. You mentioned at some point that the aphid, for example, would feed on the plant exudate, which is like yes. nectar. And if the, mush, the fungus eats it up, the aphid has nothing to feed on. Is that how it works? As well as the bacteria, yes. So they basically get into that symbiotic relationship before a non-beneficial organism comes along. Yeah. That's how that works. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That is the recommend spray. I love it so much. How, long <laughs> how how much how do you recommend by what method to spray it and how dense? Um, well, the density that I have learned, you want to make sure that you have at least three hundred micrograms of bacteria and you wanna have at least two hundred to three hundred micrograms of fungi per gallon. Um, and I am able, I, look at, I do that kind of stuff under a microscope doing um, quantitative soil assessment and counting. Uh, so that's how I do that. So if you, if you can, you can treat a whole, acre, a whole acre with five gallons of tea if the tea is really, really good. Um, but it's, you need to make sure. So if you have a not so good tea, you're going to look more at using about 20 gallons. But something that I've, uh, recommend is if you can do like a five gallon bucket and you know that it's a dense tea and you know that all the organisms are in there um, and there's enough food resources in there you can literally take your plant and then just dump it into your tea bucket as it's brewing and then take it out because um, you want to make sure that you have at least a 70 percent coverage of the leaf surface on the top and the bottom of the leaf as well as um, the stem and the stalk and the bark and the trunks all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure to have at least a seventy percent coverage, um, and you need to make sure that you have uh, enough organisms in the tea. So, 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 so one way to totally cover the plant, you can simply dunk it in the compost tea. That's yes, one way. Yes, you can. Hmm. But when you have like a twenty-foot tree, it gets a little bit. It's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, but for example. Um, yeah, for example, in aquaponics, if you've got, you know, your plants growing, whatever, and you can take the whole thing, maybe it's infested with aphids. So actually, like, if you infest, you put an infested plant with aphids into that tea, they will kind of go away, or would you expect that? Um, I would expect the plants to grow a lot better, uh, because as the, as the soil food web increases and becomes more and more beneficial, the plant is more resilient as well, so it's more able to ward off that kind of a thing. Um, so, because for me, when when there's an insect problem, the plant is essentially asking for that kind of a thing to happen. But that's just how it works in my mind. So, yeah. he said, like, you have to be confident, right? Okay, more more questions. Okay. Um, is it a... I think it's on. Have you ever replaced the nutrient solution in the hyd hydroponic system solely with uh, compost tea? Another part would be, is there a significant difference between compost tea and a worm casting tea? Um, well, worm casts are a, a form of compost. Um, but I personally have never worked with hydroponics and replacing it 
uh, conventional nutrient solutions with um, compost tea. I know that it is plausible and possible because essentially um, if you have a compost tea that has enough uh, protozoa in it, like flagellates and amoebae and nematodes, they will cycle the nutrients in that water. I personally have never done an experiment or worked with that. Um, I know that there is some information out there though and some research out there and it is very much possible. Um, but you have to make sure that you're not also using a conventional nutri nutrient solution um, because most of the times those will uh, kill the organisms if you're trying to replace that with the tea. You also have to make sure that if you're going to use a compost tea in a hydroponic system, you have to make sure that uh, you don't go anaerobic and that you don't cre create any kind of anaerobic areas. Uh, anaerobic basically means your oxygen, you have less than six milligrams of oxygen per liter of water. Um, all right, you, so you need to make sure that you clean a lot because the bacteria will uh, create glues. And then within those glues, they'll create an anaerobic um, environment in there because that's, that's what's just going to happen with their glues and everything like that. Um, and then with the vermi casts, the worm casts, uh, that you have to be um, careful with it because you don't necessarily know that all of the human pathogens or E. coli are out of it or the weed seeds and everything like that. Um, worm castings are amazing though. Uh, it, there's been studies out there that have shown that um, E. coli within five millimeters of an earthworm uh, surface are destroyed and killed. Um, as well, when uh, earthworms take uh, a bite of food, when it goes through their system, uh, it will essentially crush everything inside of it, uh, and then it, when it poops out its cast, um, it's aerobic. Um, so worm casting is great. Uh, you just have to be careful about the starting materials that you use. Um, but worm, worm compost that I've looked at under the microscope um, has been great that I've seen uh, conventional kinds of stuff. Um, so there's really good stuff out there. You just need to make sure that the organisms are present, where it's basically a waste of time. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, more questions. Question. Do you ever, or have you ever added chitin to your compost? Do you add chitin to your compost? Chitin? Is, that's, is that like an insect exoskeleton? Yes. Or it's, it's like hair? It's, it's that kind it's of stuff? Bound, yes. Uh, okay. Chit well, mm. chitinase is, uh, that was actually my question too. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question too? It kind of goes with that. Mm -hmm. Will you, will you speak up a yeah, yeah. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, again, going uh, with the pest management aspect of the compost teas, um, what's, your, mm -hmm. what's your experience with, uh, like Casey had met and mentioned, uh, chitinase, peroxidase, these are plant hormones that are produced. Uh, it's a systemic acquired resistance, I believe it's the term. Do you have any experience um, with that in your research? It's something I found very interesting. And, don't know very much about. I know I know that in worm compost, um, that kind of plant hormone will be created. Um, the specifics of it, I'm not quite sure. Um, it sounds like chitin is um, a, a very complex molecule. So for me, that would indicate that it would be a fungal food. So it would select for fungal growth in the compost, um, which is what's missing. So I think that would be a good thing. Uh, is it just, what, is it like a natural source or is it purchased from a store or? Uh, it can be derived from shrimp shells, but you can, there's companies that sell, it, that sell it for <laughs> exorbitant <laughs> prices in powder form. I use but. human hair in mine. Hmm? Human hair. Yes. Yes. You can compost with that. <laughs> and dog hair. So. Yeah. And then. That would be a fungal food. In my mind. And, uh, Save that with shavings next time. A follow-up question is, um, in terms of, like you said, you know, you have a 45-day window, or depending on the environmental controls of where you're spraying it, the microorganisms may not uh, persist as long. Is there any tips, you know, the application, in terms of, like, for instance, the weather's effect on the stoma and stuff like that on the plant, is there any way to increase the, the length of time that besides repeated applications and intervals, um, to increase the length of time that the microorganisms could live on the foliar surfaces and things like that? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, you can make sure that the soil food web that the plant is already established in a really good soil food web because then the plant will produce more for the microorganisms on the leaf surface. Um, as well, when you go out to spray your tea, you can add foods during the spraying process so that you give them something to eat when they get out in the field or in the greenhouse or wherever you're spraying it, that kind of thing. So. Okay. Thank you. And also, most of the time, for um, most foliar sprays, you want to use a brand new compost, unless you decide to feed, or use an old compost and then feed it um, about two weeks before, like I said. So, yeah. hey, what is your Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Uh, other questions? So, mm. what exactly does he recommend feeding the compost to get uh, that high fungi um, consuming? Yeah, so what, ex what exactly do you feed the compost um, for the high fungus growth? Fish hydrolysate. Uh, do you know what hydrolysates are? No. 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 No, no. no? okay. Hydrolysate is essentially um, a blend in water. It's basically something that's suspended in water. Um, so for a fish hydrolysate, for example, it is you, take a, you eat your fish, and then you take everything left over, and you put it into your blender with some water and you press blend. And then you have a fish hydrolysate. And it's an incredibly complex because it's um, all that cartilage and scales and all that kind of a thing. So what's the only thing that's going to be able to eat it is um, fungi because there's so much more carbon to nitrogen. Um, so And fungi are more capable of consuming that. So you can feed uh, hydrolysates. Like I said before, when I was in Haiti, I was making chicken hydrolysates out of leftover chicken bones. Um, other complex uh, materials like oat, uh, ground up oats, um, you know, like you, leaves, that kind of thing. Um, you just want to make sure that uh, what you're feeding won't add a pathogen to the compost. Um, even though when you aerate, your tea, it will select for aerobic organisms because you're keeping it aerated, um, that kind of thing. So um, humic acid, like I said before, if you have a really good um, thermal, aerobic thermal compost, humic acid is plentiful. Um, so yeah, uh, the more complex the material, the better. Um, so yeah. To uh, comp compound on that is a uh, spent beer mash. I heard that might be a good, it's free. And is that a good? Spent you have to fight off the pig farmers first because they will get right in there. <laughs> That's been my experience um, in Colorado. We were trying to source um, beer mash for that, but all the pig farmers are taking it all. Okay. Um, and that's okay. Uh, from, in my experience, beer mash is um, a high nitrogen component. So that, that is going to be what you add to your aerobic thermal compost to heat it up um, so that you can start your thermal process. <laughs> okay. Uh, soy, soybean meal too. Will, will hydrolysate still be beneficial after freezing the material that you get them from? Will, hydro will hydrolysate still be beneficial if you froze the material that you're working with for, for um, the hydrolysate? What, what was frozen? Like say the, say the fish, say the fish was frozen. No, it shouldn't, it shouldn't do anything like that. No. So it's still beneficial. It's still it's still good you're saying. So yes. You just take your compost and make it with hydrolysate and let it grow for a few days before you brew it. Like two weeks. Mm, yeah, two weeks is good. You don't want to use too much. Um, if you get your compost more than about fifty percent moist with your hydrolysate and everything, it can turn really stinky because it goes anaerobic. Um, so you need to make sure to not do too much. I would recommend every compost is different. Um, so you want to make sure to test a little bit, take a handful, and see what actually works for it. Um, you're not always going to see active mycelium growing uh, visibly with the naked eye. So that's why using a microscope is really beneficial because you can look at it on that level like 400 times, like, you know, um, to actually see what kind of fungal component you have in there. Um, so with the hydrolysis and the feeding and everything, you just want to make sure to not get your compost too, too wet. Um, you want to keep it at about, when you store compost, you want it to be about 35 to 40% moisture. Um, in the feeding process, you want to make sure it's about 45% to 50%. Um, and you can do that through a simple squeeze test. 
Um, if you take just a small amount of your compost in your hand and you squeeze it just like this, um, one drop that comes out, not like an incredibly, not like the super dude you want to give a big handshake to, not that kind of squeezing, just a really delicate kind of like a squeeze and everything like that. One drop that comes out, that's about 50%. You, if a little bit less than that, it is in the range that you want it during the feeding process. Um, so yeah. So I would recommend just taking like a handful and uh, just adding maybe like a tablespoon of hydrolysate and some water and getting it up to moisture um, so that it can start to grow. So so for the hydrolysate, so you're saying basically, take, you know, say t you take your chicken bones, put them in a grinder, pl press grind, and then throw them on your compost pile right after? Or how long do you have to wait? With water. Um, with water. With water. Uh, well, grind yes, it with water. water. Um, you can do it fairly immediately, uh, just like right away. There's, if you let it sit there, it might go anaerobic. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I've had good experience using chicken hydrolysates um, as a fungal food in teas before. So, so yeah. them and also okay. you can feed your compost with a compost tea. Um, say you're brewing your tea with edit, with like extra hydrolysates or humic acids, that kind of a thing. Um, and then you feed your compost with that. That way you can select for the organisms that you want and then put them back into your compost. That when you use that compost later on, it will be that much greater and there will already be food resources there as well. Um, so, but I would recommend experimenting and just seeing what's in your compost because you're not going to really know what's in your compost unless you can literally see visibly the mycelium that's there or you have a microscope. Um, so. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do so to answer your question, you can you can use it right after you blend it. So. Mm -hmm. What does he recommend feeding Thank you. the tea when he first starts brewing it? Is it is he using molasses? Or yeah, when you first start brewing the tea, what do you recommend as the food? And how much? And um, how much? Say you're doing a five-gallon bucket. In a five-gallon bucket, it depends on what's in the tea. If you already have, or what's in the compost, um, I would play around with it because my experience is that sometimes... Uh, there's so much um, hydrolysate uh, that it will just all sink to the bottom, um, that kind of thing. So you want to play around with it. You know, if, it, if it's a really great compost, you don't need to use as much foods. If it's a really poor compost, you'll need to use more foods. But essentially, you just need to make sure that it stays aerobic in that process so that there's nothing that settles at the bottom because that's where you can kind of go back and go wrong. Um, so, but with most of the time, uh, you don't really want to select for bacteria. Uh, molasses will select for bacteria because it's a sugar, um, and it has a much narrower C to N ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio, which will uh, allow the bacteria to flourish and thrive. Um, and if you use too much of a bacterial food, the bacteria will reproduce so quickly that they will take up all of the oxygen in the tea that you're brewing, and it will go anaerobic. Um, so you don't want to, generally, you don't really want to use bacterial foods like sugars and everything because there's already so much bacteria out there. Um, but if you wanted to just be able to take like five gallons and treat a whole acre, um, if you can monitor it correctly and keep the aeration up enough, you can definitely use um, molasses and that kind of a thing. You want to use unsulfured black strap molasses. The more complex the sugar, the better because it will select for a greater diversity of bacteria in the tea. So the greater the diversity, the greater the protection, the greater the soil can live. So. so specifically, maybe what, like a teaspoon per five gallons or how much around? Um, well, I, in, in general, um, you know, I guess I've used like pinches of sugar before and that has been really successful. Um, but again, it just kind of comes back to this, uh, a, I guess a general recipe for a bacterial tea would be about a tablespoon, um, of molasses if it's a bad compost or like a teaspoon of molasses if it's a really good compost, um, for five gallons. So, and you want to generally the ratio for compost to water is about one pound of compost to about four gallons of water. And that's an incredibly general statement because you can have a, a an incredible compost that is just filled with organisms where you might only need a half a pound you know it just depends on the quality of the compost so okay 
More questions? <clears throat> On a long term scale, do you think that uh, for outdoor outdoor plants, adding compost and everything can actually weaken the plant? I, I heard about a guy in France that has a semence paysanne and never added water to tomato plants and never gave nothing to these plants and they actually grow wilds and you know nutrient rich and everything. Do you think long term uh, compost could basically make the plant need the nutrients to give it instead of going to get it by herself in the land? Oh, I see. So you're, you're wondering, it's kind of, for me, it reminds me of chapstick. If you use chapstick too much, your body will stop moistening your lips because you replace it. Is that what you mean? Yes. Um, okay. Well, with compost, generally, if you put out a really good compost, you're going to see benefits for about four to five years because there's a food resource for the microorganisms that are around the plant zone, or the root zone, and everything like that. So, um, I mean, your plants will go crazy if you have a really good compost, which is always beneficial. Um, but uh, whether or not it prevents the plant from wanting to grow on its own, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, that to me is a little bit confusing. So um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, will you restate your question for me so I can have a better understanding? Well, my question is simple. It, it's just, uh, yeah, sorry, it, it was on mute. My question is, 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 is just to know if you consider maybe that adding compost to an outdoor plant could, on a long, long period of time, actually make the plant need the compost instead of making her get the nutrients in the soil by herself and make it more okay, well, or okay, or whatever you call it. Well, how, how the plant gets its nutrients um, is through associations and symbiotic relationships with the microorganisms. Um, so you kind of have to have that in order for your plant to thrive. Um, so it won't, it, plants that grow the best have the highest amount of diversity um, in the soil. Uh, so you kind of need that there, <clears throat> excuse me, for the plant to be able to flourish and thrive. It's a symbiotic relationship in its growth. Are you asking another question? Yes, well, there's a, there's a plant called Moringa olifera that grows in deserts and it's known to be the most nutrient-dense plant. And you basically, they call it the never die tree because you, know, you can cut it and leave it on the ground and it's still going to sprout. How can you explain that it grows in a desert and actually get, gets to have the most densifying, to be the most densified plant and like medicinal plant in, on earth if it grows in desert? Uh my guess is absolute intelligence. Um, there is most likely bacteria out there. They might have a very specific bacterial association that they have evolved to grow with that assists them in their growth um, and their regeneration and everything like that. Uh, they're also, they're most likely have, they've evolved in that location for so long that the microclimate for the Moringa is most likely present um, to support it to grow. Um, my guess is that if you were, well, it'd be really interesting. I, I don't know too, too much about Moringa, um, but it's an awesome name, which is really cool. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, for me, for me, giving compost back to the soil and to a plant is establishing um, a soil food web, which works together in harmony with the plant. Um, because essentially when you replace all the microorganisms in the soil and everything like that for the plant, um, there is a symbiotic relationship that has been established and the plant will work with the microorganisms to get what it needs from the soil. So, because there's no soil on earth that lacks the necessary nutrients, it's the lack of biology that allows the nutrients to be present for the plant. Okay. Thank you. I agree. I agree with you. I just wonder if it's exactly how you, you said the Moringa adapted on a learned, long period of time. I'm wondering just to consider if on a long, long period of time if we because we added so many nutrients and compost we actually made our plants weaker and made them need that those nutrients but you answered my question so I, I got, okay that's that's really we, interesting though. you can go on because it's we are we are working with the evolution of the plant as well now because we understand this kind of concept 
But what I have learned is that essentially you're just giving the power back to the plant. You're giving it the tools that it needs in order to thrive by replacing the microorganisms that are lacking in the soil. In the soil so. But once, once you've done that, you don't have to repeat continually once the soil gets alive. Oh. Once the soil is um, alive, do you have to continue refeeding the microorganisms? Well, sometimes you'll have to continue to feed them, but if you have a really, really good compost, you're going to see uh, benefits for about four to five years. Um, so that's how long that will last for. Um, but I understand what you mean. Some things, but also what happens is like replacing the organic matter back in the soil so that it can continue to feed everything because that's how succession happens. In nature, it's essentially a plant will grow up and it will die and it will fall to the ground. And then the microorganisms that are present there will begin to consume it. And then fungi will start to uh, consume it and they will continually build succession of the soil. Um, and so it's a huge feeding process. If you were to go out into a beautiful old growth forest and dig down a little bit, you'll probably see active mycelium visibly with your naked eye and everything like that. And that's because of the symbiotic relationship for with the plant and the soil and all the microorganisms in it. So essentially using composts and compost tea, you are furthering the succession of the soil. Um, but to create a self-sustaining system, it's very much possible use a, utilizing the soil food web knowledge and everything like that. So, but if you really want to amp up the production of the plant, you're going to have to monitor the soil. Or you're going to have to make sure that everything is there for the organisms to do their job in the soil, in the root zone. So. Okay. Apologies, this is too basic of a question, but what do you, when you say really, really good compost? <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. That's the basic. Sorry. Okay. No, I was just joking. I What's really enjoy your question. We you ask it one more time now. What is in really What's good compost? Really good compost? And if you were okay. looking at well, it under a microscope, what would that look like? Or what would you be looking for? Um, you would be looking for protozoa. You'd be looking for flagellates and amoebae. You'd be looking for beneficial nematodes like bacterial feeding nematodes, fungal feeding nematodes, and predatory nematodes. In any um, you'd be making sure that beneficial fungal strands are present. Um, that they have a wide enough diameter, um, that they're actually <clears throat> building soil structure. Um, you want to make sure that you have a diversity of at least 16 morphological types of bacteria. Um, you want to make sure that there's a, a, a great humic acid component, um, because that's the most broken down aspect of organic matter, is humic acid. Um, you want to make sure that there is not a whole lot of actinobacteria, um, you want to make sure that there's no 